Previously on YouTube. There is a lot to love about Ryan Johnson's 2019 detective film Knives Out. I imagine if Raymond Chandler were alive today, he'd hate Knives Out and he'd hate the analysis of it that I'm about to give you. But a deft hand knows that an excess of information can dazzle audiences. Part of what makes Knives Out a good Hollywood film is that it's just packed to the gills with these little setups and payoffs, and pretty much across the board they're executed with the same subtle and confident hand. This is precisely what makes repeat viewers so rewarding because there's so much that feels natural and normal and unremarkable that was wholly intentional and in fact integral to the whole. Part 3. The Image Knives Out has a dynamic camera that is, for the most part, very traditional, all purposeful dollies and tracking shots, except for the occasional whip pan as an unexpected flourish. Maybe it's just that this was the first non-Marvel movie I'd seen in theaters in a long time, but the constant intentional motion of the camera had me energized the whole time. And admittedly, this is one of those things where my experience working in film sort of primes me to be more appreciative of the craft. Dolly shots are a pain to set up, and can take forever to get right, especially in real locations like this, so to see them executed so well with so much consistency is just solid filmmaking. But even deeper than that, there's something organic about these shots that I didn't really figure out until my most recent viewing. In David Fincher's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, there's this long tracking shot as we pull up to the Vanger estate, and it's a gorgeous move that always stuck with me in part because of how it was executed. Fincher's films are most valuable to me as experiments in digital filmmaking making, and one thing Fincher loves to do in 4K is smooth out bumpy shots. So this tracking shot is dead still because all the bumps of the car have been mapped out through motion tracking and post-production. The result is an ethereal, mechanical shot that's actually kind of alienating, which works for the film. But these days, we may as well be living in the house that Fincher built, as so often camera shake is either overemphasized or eradicated altogether. Knives Out doesn't do this, but that's not to say that it's some kind of pure, organic experience. It's shot on digital, and cinematographer Steve Yedlin developed a whole system for algorithmic post-processing of raw camera data to replicate the peculiarities of how celluloid film interacts with light. It's really fascinating stuff, but it's way too complicated for me to get into in this already overlong video. I'll just say that Yedlin's got a whole presentation about it that's very fascinating, and you should go check it out. Point is, I'm not saying that messing with the image and post is bad. That would be a ludicrous hill to die on. But what's nice about Knives Out is that they don't correct for human error, or if they do, they still leave traces. Dolly moves will have the slightest amount of jitter, focus pulls will be a second off their mark, and these are not mistakes in a ding ding that's a sin sense, they're just natural side effect of humans operating equipment. The result is a film that feels refreshingly tactile in a way I haven't seen in a really long time. There's one particular shot when Marta is leaving the Thromby estate after the will reading where she inherits all of Harlan's assets. The enraged Thromby family pursue her out of the house, demanding to know how she corrupted their patriarch and also saying some racist things for good measure. As she leaves, we get this slow dolly in and then you see the camera literally being picked up off the tripod and going directly into a handheld shot. Like literally, just Womp! Just right up off the tripod. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this stole my breath away in the theater. Handheld shots are so common at this point that I'm utterly desensitized to them, so it's really an extraordinary feat of filmmaking to make one that feels surprising. This works because it's one of maybe two handheld shots in the whole film. It's a sudden burst of subjectivity to emphasize the chaos and confusion and panic Marta is feeling in the moment. It just really stands out amid the the restrained photography of the rest of the movie. So we talked about the repetition of objects in the previous section, but now I want to talk about the repetition of images. These are distinct because while the arc of a baseball can be laid out in the script, the literal composition of the frame can only be suggested through storyboards and animatics. Now, a truly psychopathic degenerate of a director might have the whole thing engineered from the start, but generally speaking, plans always change on the day of the shoot. Because first you have the image, 
usually plan as a screenwriter and then you do the tech scout and you get more ideas for the image and then you show up on the day and now it's been dressed for the film with all the props and costumes and lighting and this gives you even more ideas. Also a lot of times props and set dressing are, uh, I won't say random, but they aren't typically summoned by the director. A good props master will build a repertoire of objects based on a template set by the director because pre-production is already a maddeningly complicated process without the director having to manually approve each and every incidental choice. Sorry to be a broken record here, I just really admire the work of the props department in this film. Anyway, let's look at the introductory frames for all the members of the Thromby family as they are interviewed at the start of the film to see how similar images can convey different messages. Now obviously each of these occurs in the same location and in action you probably won't notice much of a difference. But there are differences and they are not accidental. Here with Linda, her shoulders are almost square with the camera, and she's looking just off the camera left. Next with Richard, he's at more of a three-quarters angle from the camera, which you can tell from the exposed aperture of this lamp, which is now ever so slightly closer to the ground. This creates a distance between us and him, and makes him seem more dishonest than Linda. But if that's not enough for you, consider that Linda is framed with the iconic knife donut barely grazing her shoulder while while Richard is framed well within it. And just for that extra bit of oomph, there's a partially obscured chair in the far left of frame which might suggest something of Richard's affair. Joni's frame is almost identical to Richard's except that it's wider, we're back almost at eye level, and we've shifted a few feet more to camera right. This leaves the left side of the frame dominated by the sort of vacant reading corner which her eye is drawn to because Joni's eye line crosses directly with this lamp which is an aberrant light source and an otherwise dark space. Joni is the wife of the long-deceased fourth child of Harlan, so this empty chair now takes on a new meaning as the absent connection she has to the family. Also note that Joni is, like Richard, inside the knives. Then there's Meg, Joni's daughter, who's framed similarly to Linda, which makes sense because compared to Joni's embezzlement and Richard's cheating, Meg and Linda are innocent in Harlan's eyes. The biggest difference is the increased emphasis on this portrait of Pirate's Gold, which hints at Meg's reliance on her grandfather's wealth to pay her tuition. Also, the prominence of this painting throughout the film might suggest that Harlan's wealth wasn't actually all that earned to begin with, and that wealth in general is actually just large-scale theft. I don't know. Anyway, then we get Walt, who's an interesting sort of combo breaker in this lineup. Walt isn't guilty to Harlan in the same way Richard or Joni were. He's just kind of a shitty dude who apologizes for his literal Nazi son, and then later in the film threatens to have Marta's mom deported. So hey, isn't it a funny coincidence that Lieutenant Elliot here, the only black man in the film, is dead center of the knife circle from Walt's perspective? Gee, I wonder what that's trying to say. What amazing, insightful character your truth is this trying to impart to us? It's that Walt is racist. Now even within these five different frames, there are a few stylistic constants that are standard practice for Hollywood. We never cross the 180 degree line set up between the subject and the officers, meaning that the person being interviewed is always looking frame left. We are also keying from the outside, which basically means that our key light, the primary source of illumination on a character's face, is coming from the side of their face that's farthest away from the camera, in this case frame left. This is standard practice because it creates depth and shadow you get that classic triangle of light on the cheek. It's very, very Hollywood. But then we have Marta, whose first interview occurs outside. It's not a proper interview because it happens impromptu, but I think it's notable that Marta's first conversation with Detective Blanc occurs outside the house, disconnected from the family and its menagerie of knives. Blanc frequently refers to Marta's kind heart, making her a good nurse, and there's just something in the way the other detectives are dismissive of her in this scene that sets up a presumption presumption of innocence that wouldn't fit if this scene occurred in the library. Of course, a few minutes later, after Blanc establishes the complete timeline of the night before Harlan's death, Marta does get a proper interview in the library and the same composition as the others is replicated. But now, our 180 degree line is flipped so that Marta is looking frame right. Now if we were to lay out all of these shots and contrast them and ask which one is the one who's most likely to be the murderer, the one the film is trying to suggest is Marta because 
because she's the odd one out. So not only are we seeing how images can be repeated to tell different stories, we're also seeing how tenets of invisible style can be used artfully. Now what's interesting about Marta's shot in the library is that we are still keying from the outside, which means our key light is now coming from the opposite side of the room. If you were to cut this interview in with the others, not only would the visual grammar make it confusing, it would also feel chronologically incongruous, like it's happening at another time of day when it can't be more than an hour or two later. I point this out because there are two obvious impulses that likely occur in someone noticing this discrepancy. The first is to call it a continuity error. This scene's only a few minutes later, how come the light is coming from the wrong side of the room? It makes no sense! And the second is to dig into its symbolic significance. And I'm not gonna say there's nothing there, but I do think that everything you might say would be identical to what you'd say about the meaning of the flipped 180, which is the far more potent grammatical statement. My take is that the roaming key light is a natural side effect of the flipped 180, because keying from the inside tends to just look kinda ugly. There's always a risk you run in this kind of aggressive scene analysis where you're doing the Freud thing of trying to find the pattern in the noise no matter the cost. And while this can often lead to some surprising insights, it also has a tendency to just get kinda really goddamn tedious. There comes a point when you start losing the forest for the trees, and the time comes to get out of the minutia and actually talk about what the film is about. And Knives Out is about part four class. What I've done so far is give a bottom-up overview of how this film is structured, which is all well and good, it's important stuff for enthusiasts to understand, and it makes for pithy video content. But for that structure to be worth anything, it has to be in service of something. A well-structured film with an unintentionally meandering story still fails in spite of itself. Structure is easy to examine and quantify, but pinning down what makes the whole thing tick is a lot harder because art is more than the techniques deployed in its creation. Knives Out is an undeniably well-crafted film, but that craft only lands as well as it does because it supports and reinforces a relatable human narrative that explores, among many things, the nature of class in post-2016 America. There's something about the whodunit genre that is uniquely good at looking at the class structure of a society. It's kind of built the structure of a whodunit so that it doesn't have to slow down and describe like a power structure within a society to you, it just has that baked into it. Because really what you have in a whodunit, you have your little microcosm of society, whether it's the house or the train or the ski lodge or whatever, where this murder takes place. You have within that a group of people, these people here, who are all your suspects, and there's a power structure within that group of people, and whoever's at the top is the one who's going to get bumped off. And then you have the high to the low of this microcosm of society portrayed within these suspects. It just is kind of really good at talking about, or if not talking about, at kind of displaying uh, and examining class. So how does Knives Out examine class? First, we have to understand Marta Cabrera, the protagonist of the film, who I have criminally failed to discuss until this point, like 30 minutes into the video. She is the daughter of an undocumented immigrant whose nationality is never stated outright, except by the members of the Thrami family who just kind of assume they know where she's from. Family's from Ecuador. Family's from Paraguay. You're Brazilian nurse. Your family is from Uruguay. Wow, that's a weird plot hole. How we meet her is extremely important in helping us understand her relationship to the Thrombies. We get this extremely melodramatic sequence showing off the inside of the Thrombie mansion with its clutter of wealth and secret doors immediately telling us the kind of author and person that Harlan was. After Harlan's body is found, we cut to one week later and Marta waking up in her apartment. The contrast is immediate. Her unit is cramped, there's a lot of civilian clutter, her phone is cracked, it all feels lived in. Now it's notably not destitute, it's not like Charlie Bucket levels of poor, it's just like normal. Like, I feel like I've lived in this apartment, and I imagine most viewers would probably say the same. Narratively, this also makes us a little suspicious of her because, again, it's a murder mystery. We're trying to solve this thing as we watch it. And I think this is where the intelligence of Knives Out's writing comes into play. We're primed to guess that Marta might have murdered Harlan because her motivation is plainly obvious. Who wouldn't be envious of the rich after working with them for so long? But we also write this assumption off because, no way, that's too obvious. It's not going to be the first character we meet who is the killer. 
that's too easy. Then, of everyone who could be the killer, we see Ransom as also way too obvious as the one person who left Harlan's birthday party suspiciously early. But then it turns out Marta did kill Harlan, accidentally. But then it turns out, no, she didn't. It was Ransom trying to dupe her out of the family inheritance by switching Harlan's medications. All this self-awareness means we get to the end of the film having basically been surprised by the most obvious answers. I just think that's really clever. With the exception of the Nazi piss boy, everyone in the Thromby family treats Marta well. Meg counts her as a close friend, Walt offers to use Harlan's inheritance to take care of her, and Linda hugs her like she's family. How are you doing, kiddo? It's important that they don't treat her like the help, because the bourgeois millionaires of America today like to think of themselves as caring and generous people. They're the sort of white liberals who gleefully talk about the bootstrap narrative of Marta's family and brag about seeing Hamilton on Broadway. Particularly revealing is the party scene, where Richard uses Marta as a prop in his argument for why undocumented immigrants did it the wrong way, completely ignorant to the fact that her family did not in fact do it the right way. It's immediately clear that while they care about Marta in a nominal sense, they don't actually know a damn thing about her. This of course comes home to roost after the will reading reveals that Marta now controls the entire Thromby estate. Suddenly, all the goodwill they had towards Marta is gone, and they turn on her like she must be a parasite. Clearly, Harlan wouldn't have given her his fortune out of the kindness of his heart. It must be some kind of plot. Were you boinking my father? Later on, Meg calls Marta, asking what she plans to do with the money, and Marta offers to take care of Meg and her family, just as Walt did. But Meg hangs up mid-sentence. The wealthy are happy to assist the poor on their own terms, to declare what's considered reasonable or responsible for them to have, but such generosity is immediately revealed to be nothing more than an elaborate form of auto fellatio when the shoe is on the other foot. The primary purpose of charity is not to help people, but to make the rich feel better about stealing from the poor and largely letting them starve to death. They want to control the wealth because they believe it's their natural providence to do so, regardless of how fast actual such claims may be. You think I'm not gonna fight to protect my home? Our birthright? Our ancestral family home? <laughs> that, that, that is hooey. You know, Holland, he bought this place in the 80s from a Pakistani oh, real estate billionaire. Hint, they never are factual. Most illustrative of all is the relationship between Meg and Jacob. We basically only learn one thing a piece about them. Meg is a crypto-Marxist. And Jacob is literally a Nazi. Which you might note are diametrically opposed ideological views. They have seemingly nothing in common and would sooner kill each other than spend more than a few seconds in a room together. And yet, when Marta's given their family's wealth, suddenly they're on the same side. Because class solidarity always trumps ideology. When we're talking about politics, oh yeah, sure, they're at war. But when it comes to their ability to pay the bills, well, we can set aside our differences until after we've got that issue sorted out. Because you see, rich Marxists, rich liberals, and rich Nazis are all rich before they're anything else, and their material interests will always be more aligned among themselves than with those of the poor. I think this is why Benoit Blanc takes such a liking to Marta from the start, why he doesn't immediately pin the whole thing on her despite noticing the blood on her shoe. Blanc is an eccentric guy who probably hasn't had to worry about rent for a long time, what with his last case being written about in the New York Times, but you certainly get the sense that he's much closer to working class than any of the Thrombies ever were. He wants to believe that Marta has a kind heart because he absolutely does not want the Thrombies to receive their inheritance, and he clearly gets a kick out of making rich people squirm. So we see the Thrombies use guilt, threats of deportation, and general infantilization to intimidate Marta into giving up Harlan's inheritance, but by the end of the film she's gotten a confession out of ransom and now controls the Thromby fortune unopposed. She walks out onto the balcony holding Harlan's mug as the disaffected Thrombies look up at her, and Marta takes a long judgmental sip of white tears. Looks like your knives are out. Yeah!
But hold on, what is this ending saying? Like it rules, it absolutely owns. I love this ending. But what is Ryan Johnson actually trying to say? At first, I thought it was about the importance of redistributing wealth, but this isn't wealth redistribution so much as it's taking wealth from one person and giving it to another person. Nothing structural has actually been addressed here, so it's entirely conceivable that 50 years down the line, we could see the events of this film repeat with the Cabrera family. This is actually why this video has taken so long to finish. Not because I think the politics of the film overall are muddy, I think they're crystal clear, but the ending is kind of hard to parse because it is deliberately open-ended. Whether Marta decides to help the Thrombies is up to her, whether they try to put up a legal challenge against her is up in the air. We just leave at this moment of elevation and call it a victory, which it absolutely is. But again, it's not solving anything. So after months of indecision, I finally talked to my friend Eric Sophia McAllister, he might know as the host of the channel Curio, about Knives Out, and I think we kind of came up with some good ideas and they wrote this bit in the script for me to read, which I'm going to be doing in my best impersonation of their voice. Just kidding, I'm not going to do that, that would be completely insufferable. The ending of Knives Out can be hard to get a read on thematically. Marta gets the house, the money, everything, and the Thromby family are left looking up at her in the driveway, dumbstruck by their collective loss and already backstabbing each other. Linda drags on her cigarette and Marta raises Harlan's coffee mug to her lips, hands obscuring its message until it simply reads, My House. The reason this is a bit hard to read thematically is that, well, what the heck is it supposed to say? Like, even if we assume the film is proposing redistributing the wealth of rich white Americans, which is in itself a bit of a leap from what you can concretely prove, Chairman McCarthy. It pretty solidly demonstrates repeatedly that money corrupts everyone, even the SJW teen majoring in crypto Marxist post deconstructuralist cuckoldry studies. So we can't really be proposing that the solution to systemic inequality is to simply take everything from those who currently have and give it all to those who currently have not. I mean, Ryan Johnson isn't that cool, right? It turns out the best way to get a handle on the thematically opaque ending is to view it as trolling. Now, trolling is a bit of a negative connotation. We've all dealt with trolls at this point. We know how horrible it feels to try to talk to this infuriating little shit who only wants to piss you off and waste your time and somehow knows exactly all the buttons to push. But it also feels pretty amazing to troll somebody. Maybe you go on your Facebook where you're still friends with the folks from back home and you post everyone deserves love equally, whether you're cisgender, heterosexual, or normal. Maybe you see some asshole boomer talking smack about the greatest generation of memers yet to exist by claiming we wouldn't survive in a war so you pop into their mentions and just say, all troops are rubes, TBH. Maybe you're feeling spicy and you just go on and tweet, white genocide is good, actually. It feels good to piss off the people who have the bad opinions. And besides how it feels, trolling also serves a sociological purpose. Trolling somebody by stating an exaggerated version of your position sorts everybody into the people who agree with your real actual position and therefore don't care, and the people who don't agree with your real actual position and therefore get angry at the exact exaggerated version. What Knives Out is doing with this ending is trolling anybody who doesn't agree with the rest of the film. If you were watching this and thinking it was good, you will guaranteed love the ending. But if you were watching along, not connecting with it, disagreeing with the foundational ideas of the film, you'll get mad as hell. Basically, if you were one of the Thrombies and you were watching this movie, the ending is designed to piss you off specifically. It's important to understand that detectives in detective stories are always a cipher for the person writing them. The principal dilemma of the detective story is that perfection demands a combination of qualities not found in the same mind. The fellow who can write you a vivid and colorful prose simply won't be bothered with the coolie labor of breaking down unbreakable alibis. If you know all you should know about ceramics and Egyptian needlework, you don't know anything at all about the police. If you know that platinum won't melt under about 2800 degrees Fahrenheit by itself, but will melt at the glance of a pair of deep blue eyes when put close to a bar of lead, then you don't know how men make love in the 20th century. What Chandler is saying here is that men fuck. What Chandler is saying here is that every detective story is limited by the knowledge of its author and therefore must be an expression of their blind spots and biases. Which is why I think it's important that Marta has the fantastical ability of vomiting when she lives. It gives the proceedings an air of surreality. This is not meant to be a purely realistic, hard-boiled detective story, hence why I think Chandler would hate it. In the same way that Looper, another Ryan Johnson film, breaks down under scrutiny, the actual the actual murder mystery at the heart of Knives Out can start to feel a little frail when you look at it too closely. But also, just like Looper, that really doesn't matter. The point is that stories are fictional constructs. Yes, if you lay things out, X or Y doesn't make sense, but ultimately that's all irrelevant 
because it's fake. Movies aren't real things. Even documentaries are just an authored fiction attempting to depict the fundamentally undepictable. Again, drowning in a sea of subjectivity, we've been over this before already. With all this in mind, I think we finally reveal Knives Out to be a combination of wish fulfillment and no small amount of shoulder shrugging. There's no doubt that the harassment campaign aimed at Johnson and the actors he worked with on The Last Jedi influenced the creation of this film, but as radicalizing as that experience likely was, speaking here from my own experience, I don't think Johnson lands much further left than the typical white liberal in Hollywood. He's certainly aware of white liberalism's hypocrisy. He very clearly diagnoses works like Hamilton as products for the inflation of liberalism's ego. Immigrants. We get the job done. I'd even go so far as saying that Knives Out is the white man's get out. Get out. Get out. But ultimately, I don't think Johnson has a solution in mind. I think he's stuck where a whole lot of people are, deeply and uncomfortably aware of the rise of fascism in America and the ever-broadening wealth gap between the rich and the poor, yet infuriatingly at a loss for how to do anything about it since, you know, it's easier for some to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So rather than trying and failing to come up with a solution, Johnson does the far more interesting thing of saying, maybe it's not my place to suggest a solution. Maybe well-meaning white liberals are actually making things worse by assuming they know what's best, like say, Harlan Thrombey, and it's time to hand the reins over to someone else. Beyond the basic schadenfreude of seeing Marta successfully pull one over on a bunch of rich people, the film is essentially saying, hey, maybe we should let the children of immigrants have a shot? Like, they can't do worse than we have. In this way, it's kind of trolling every white person in the audience, challenging them to accept that they'll never know more about what's wrong with this country than the people who are most directly affected by its policies, and as such, they're the ones who should dictate how amends are made. I love movies. I went to film school, I worked in film production, I'm sometimes even paid to talk about them. But looking around at the world in July 2020, it's impossible to ignore the fact that art is not a solution. No matter how well done or thoughtfully executed it may be, art can only ever be a suggestion, and it's a suggestion that's left wildly up to interpretation. Bong Joon-ho's Parasite is a similarly insightful examination of class warfare, albeit from a much further left perspective, yet even this still won Best Picture. If it was truly a successful work of pure communist polemic, the capitalist liberals running the academy would never have given it the time of day. Which isn't a slight against Parasite, just as it isn't a slight against Knives Out or any film with radical politics that receives widespread critical and commercial acclaim. The fact is, stories can only do so much for us when capitalism can take even the most leftist ideas and recuperate them to somehow support what they blatantly oppose. No art exists that can topple ideology, because ideology sees only what it wants to see. Awareness of class does not translate into an eradication of class. Knives Out is artfully prepared comfort food that does the best it can with what it has. But it's not enough, because comfort always comes at a cost to someone. We are always passing the bill for our convenience down the line, and there's no art on earth that can fix that. And to its credit, it's not trying to fix that. I've watched this movie almost a dozen times, and the fact is I love it. It makes me happy. And at a certain point, that kind of just has to be enough. Anyway, sure hope the country survives long enough for there to be a sequel. <laughs> God, we're so fu- Hello and thank you for watching this video. I want to thank my collaborator, Eric Sophia McAllister, for prodding me on to get part one and part two of this video done, as well as helping me write the script, and also for recording some voiceover bits. And of course, I want to thank Molly Noyes for making the music for both parts of this video, with a little bit of help from Toby Fox and Baphometrics. Links to their work are in the description. I also want to thank my $10 patrons, Brianna Bergen, Richard Dunbeck, Natalie Watts, Blake, Jay Jorts, June Circuit, Nate Kiernan, Athiette, Elise Alway, Innate Optimist, Susie Minike, Cynthia Darling, Zavak, 
Cam Chacon, L Something Something, Quirk, Gary Marshall, Mad Fakes, Mountain Snow, Faye, Z, Marcus Kitzinger Swishy Cube, J Mac D, Cayenne Shepard, Scott Olson, Not Sam, Set, Jennifer Palmer, Anarcho Duck, Richard Daly, Austin McCauley, Robert Cutts, Amy Mims, Zip Durango, Game Over Girl, Catherine Crawl, and Jenny Wang. If you like what I do and you want me to continue to keep doing it, you can support me on Patreon.com slash LTAS. $5 patrons get access to behind the scenes materials for all of my videos, which range from unedited scripts and handwritten notes to deleted scenes and unused materials. For this video, I'll be releasing a full length commentary track for Knives Out, just in case 40 odd minutes of me talking about this film wasn't enough for you. I've also still been writing a lot of fan fiction and also just some original fiction, and I occasionally do podcasts, and you can keep up with all of that stuff on Twitter at HMS No Fun. Okay, that's the business end of things. Now I've got to ramble for a bit longer so that the credits for the patron names have time to sort of scroll by at a, at a reasonable speed. I always forget how good of a filmmaker Ryan Johnson is. Like, every time one of his movies comes out, I'm like, eh, whatever. And then I go see it, and I'm like, oh yeah, I love this guy. I've liked, like, all of his movies every time I've watched them. Like, The Brothers Bloom is just criminally underrated. Um, what else? What else? Oh, The Last Jedi is the only Star Wars movie. Bye!